For Kruma Media's Policy, I'm Sanel Damini. Joining me today is political analyst Professor Raymond Sadna to discuss his column titled A Response to General Crisis, Social Hope and Collective Action for Change in South Africa. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. So, Professor, you place a lot of emphasis on the distinction uh, between individualized hope and collective or even social hope. Is this as important as you suggest, or are you not perhaps uh, nostalgic for your communist uh, collective past? Um, I don't think it's got much to do with my communist collective past because I never lived under communism. But what I, what this distinction relates to is are we struggling for freedom for everyone, for a better life for everyone? Or is it a question of having jobs, income that allows some of us to lead a better life? For example, if you are more wealthy, you can put your children in a private school. If the clinic near you is um, inadequately equipped, you can go to a private doctor. Or the mm-hmm. clinic may be 50 kilometers away. And because you have a car, you can deal with it. Now, the question that I'm raising is when we talk about hope, we ought to need to look at it as social hope, not individual hope or what uh, this chap Aronson calls privatization of hope, whereby you look after your private needs. And I think when people, a lot of people are depressed it, about what's going on in South Africa, they're really talking only about the private situation. We mm. need to be looking at the society as a whole. When I write, I'm not writing about my private situation. My private situation is much better than very many people in the country, but I'm aware of the fact that there are a lot of people who are starving, who, you know, they're not declared to be starving, but we've, I've mentioned it in previous columns, how at least two women are reported to have killed her children and herself because they didn't have food and she didn't have money for food. And this is part of the scandal that is post-apartheid South Africa. You also argue for a collective social movement, but uh, recognize that there have uh, been negative experiences uh, with the former USSR and liberations movement like the African National Congress. So how does one find or establish uh, such a movement, Professor? You know, the number of reasons, we have to look at what were the reasons why uh, such movements were not successful. And Aronson refers to uh, a situation where the collective need or collective was treated as a way of erasing the individual needs. We need to get, if we build a new collective movement, we have to understand what is the relationship between the collective aspirations and the individual needs that each of us has that may in some respects be unique, they may be cultural, they may be religious, they may be sexual identities and a number of other things which at different various times have been erased in various countries. Now to establish a movement is very difficult because when we look around us, we don't see the seeds of this. But what Aronson and this woman, Rebecca Solnit, point to is throughout history. There have been movements like uh, the bus boycotts in the South, in the United States, the other things that started in a small way but became big, or union movements which started in a small factory but then spread to others and they became a big collective thing. The civil rights movement in the United States uh, started not by the majority, as was the case in South Africa, because African Americans are a minority in the United States. But they managed to win over sufficient 
people from the majority who were whites to force the government to enact certain civil civil rights legislation, although we know in the United States that there is not yet equality between black and white and white and other minorities in the United States. So we have to look around us, but we also need to look at other people's history, but our own history, because we have a long history in South Africa of a variety of different types of movements, some of them millenarian types of religious movements, some of them conventional political movements, some of them single issue movements, which nevertheless affect a large part of the population who want to change the country. Mm. And lastly, Professor, you suggest that uh, the African National Congress slogan, which says a better love for all, is inapplicable to post a uh, apartheid South Africa. Is that not an exaggeration in the light of poverty relief uh, through social grants and similar interventions that we've seen? I think it's true that the social grants have been a very important factor in alleviating poverty in South Africa. But we've seen a situation in many months of this year where social grants have not been paid or not been paid on time, and people have had to wait. People in wheelchairs had to wait for a very long time, and the uh, government doesn't take proper responsibility for this. But even with social grants, we know people are hungry, people are without homes, people are living in the streets or under bridges or things like that, and they remain oppressed. It's not oppressed by white South Africa, but the, the experience is one of oppression where their basic needs are not met. Their The unemployment level is not 37%, as some of the media say, 37% plus that 15 to 20% or more who have given up looking for work who are not counted in that figure. But they should be counted because they are, in fact, unemployed. So there's a lot of inequalities in this country, and those on the wrong side of inequality are actually hungry and suffer other privations. They don't have proper clothing, proper health care, enough uh, to eat, and they don't have prospects of it getting better. That was political analyst Professor Raymond Satna speaking to Krima Media's policy, discussing his column titled Response to General Crisis, Social Hope and Collective Action for Change in South Africa, Part 1.